It's Tuesday, December 6th. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download Podcast brought to you by Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. How much will it cost to ride Metro next year? It's really anyone's guess with CEO Randy Clark proposing fare hikes, D.C. Council members pushing to make buses free in the district, and WMATA hoping to bring back automated trains. WTOP's Luke Lukert breaks all this down for us. We all know that it is very complicated to kind of understand exactly what you're paying when you go yeah. ride the metro train. You never really know exactly. So mm-hmm. they're, they're kind of simplifying it. And I just learned this, but wedding cakes are expensive, Megan tells me. Uh, yeah. But WTOP's Luke Luker has a solution. Thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Cloherty. And I'm Luke Garrett. Metro is on a mission to improve service as ridership is still below pre-pandemic levels, well below. And safety is still a concern for those who do use the rail system. Now, WMATA, which runs Metro, says it wants to automate train operations. In a report, the transit agency said automating the trains will increase safety and reliability, but it has an uphill battle against public memory after a deadly red line crash back in 2009 that was caused in part by the then automated system. Joining us now to talk about Metro's plan to automate is WTOP's Luke Lukert. Thanks for being here, man. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, So people may not know, or maybe it's, you know, you kind of remember some details, but since that 2009 crash in Fort Totten, trains have been manually operated. Clearly, this would be a big change. Tell us what you know about the proposal to automate. Yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, since 2009, basically, they've gotten rid of automation, a, a system, an automation system that was installed in Metro since the 70s. So pretty old system Mm. of automation. And for the last 13 or so years, we've had manual operation, which means that the operator, the driver of the train manually stops and starts a train and manually opens a door, all that kind of stuff. And you can see how that, you know, just like when you're driving your car, that can lead to some issues uh, right there. And so now they're trying to, after, you know, finishing up uh, some of those safety precautions that caused that, you know, horrific train crash in uh, 2009, are kind of moving back towards automation. Mm. And moving out of that, like, driving room part of the train, would passengers notice a difference between, you know, in-person manual operation and automated operation? Would they see a difference? Um. So... You know, it, it's hard to tell if they would see a difference, you know, on every single train, but they might see more reliable service mm. because you don't have that human element of stopping and starting the train. You kind of have a more system wide uh, automated train system. So you might see more reliable service. That is one thing that they pointed to. Another thing that they pointed to is they really do think now that all the uh, fixes have been made with some of those circuit breakers that really caused the last issue at that Fort Totten uh, crash, that it would probably be a safer experience for riders. How? I mean, the, uh, the, the, the number one cause of safety concerns is operators running what they call red signals, red lights, essentially, um, manually running those. Mm. And this would eliminate that. We've seen, I mean, I've seen videos, like social media videos of how like the trains run in Korea, for example, where it's like they miss each other by like a second or something. But because it's automated, Mm. there's always the system knows where every train is and it just makes Mm -hmm. everything so much faster Mm. as opposed to like having the human element to it where you're like, okay, that train has cleared. Mm. Now I will let this train forward. I mean, they're being safe about it, but I think it changes how quickly trains can go how how quickly maybe a train would arrive at a station, right, Luke? And like doors opening and Absolutely. closing, stuff like that. Like I think it would just everything would be like a little bit faster, is my understanding. Yeah. Absolutely. And and everything would be controlled from that rail control center and kind of so so you you have something controlling it that sees the whole big picture rather than an mm. operator that is seeing what's right in front of them or right behind them. And is WMATA, you know, DC's transit agency, are they the outlier that they're still using in person, you know, drivers? Absolutely. So they did a survey of the 42 biggest rail operations, metro operations in the world. They are one of eight that still uses manual operations. Wow. And of those eight, they are the only one that technically has an automation system installed, but is still using a manual operations. 
So does this mean that the drivers would go away or is it just like the we know it as the rock, but basically it's like the central um, the, like the nucleus of the entire system um, that would be automated and there would still be drivers. Do they do they get into like the logistics there? Yeah. So what they have said is they want to right now they're at grade one of automation. They, there's a whole lot of uh, right levels. Know, yeah. Interesting. Uh, you know, very uh, bureaucratic language around it. But what they want to do is go to a GOA2, which is grade of automation level two. And that means that the stopping and starting is automated, but drivers are right there at the controls if any emergency happens. And if anything needs to be done, they can handle those. Mm. You mentioned um, this in part of your answer before, but I just want to make sure we hit it because when, I mean, I didn't remember this back in the 2009 crash, it wasn't really the automated system that failed, right? It was like the circuits that were inside the track that were broken or something and they weren't communicating. Can you talk about how Metro is saying, well, we're going to address that so you don't have to worry about that, you know, Sally Ryder? Yeah, that so that was uh, the issue that there there were some uh, faulty uh, circuits that basically didn't tell the train that was traveling at high speeds that there was a train right in front of it. And that's what caused such a horrific crash, because, I mean, if you had somebody behind the wheels, they would have been able to see the train slow down, maybe not so terrible. But because it was automated and uh, that circuit did not actually tell the train, it was still going at almost full speed when it collided. And the back of that the train. pictures of it are crazy. I mean, if you look up, Ugh. it's like one train is like literally on top mm. of the other train. Nine people were killed. I mean, if you were on that train, that's a life changing experience. And I imagine if you hear, oh, Metro's going automated, you're like, wait, what? Right. There's definitely some mm-hmm. concerns out there that they're going to have to quell and, and prove that it's not going to happen again. Exactly. So just today, you know, Randy Clark released a proposal regarding the fiscal outlook of Metro and, you know, really fair hikes. Um, tell us about this proposal and what's really within it. Yeah, you know, four months into the job, there's there's a lot of things changing at, at Metro. Uh, and two of the things in this proposed budget that won't take effect until July 1st, fare hikes and train frequency. So right now, if you're uh, riding Metro, you know, you're seeing a train maybe every 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on the line. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's very variable. I mean, a blue line is every 15 minutes. Red line, which has the best, is eight, but mm, t- sometimes 10, right. 15 minutes for a lot of others. Um, they are planning, starting July 1st, to try to increase what they call the core stations, which are, you know, those big Metro Center stations, uh, Chinatown Gallery Place, mm-hmm. uh, to every three to six minutes, wow. which is just a huge, I mean, that's almost you like know, a doubling. Minute. Yeah. Yeah. That's almost doubling the amount of trains that uh, passengers are going to start seeing at stations. Um, this is obviously coming as they're they're rolling out more and more 7,000 series cars. But uh, as you mentioned, also, they're, they're changing up some fare restructuring. And we all know that it is very complicated to kind of understand exactly what you're paying when you go yeah. ride the metro train. You never really know exactly. So mm-hmm. they're they're kind of simplifying it, kind of like their bus. It's a $2 base fare just to hop on. And then still kind of like the old system, they are doing a variable rate for where you're going, but it's going to be simplified to 40 cents a uh, mile. Oh, interesting. So the rush hour yeah. thing is going away. It's just based on the distance. Correct. Well, there there is still there's still going to be some things left over. You're still going to have a $2 late night and weekend fare. So those are going to still remain the same. But for right now, you're looking at a, a $2 base fare with 40 cents added for every mile mm. traveled. And at the end of the day, that's going to be more expensive than it currently is. Yeah, not a ton, about 5 on average, five, six percent more. Okay, obviously, it depends on how far you're taking the system. Correct. Right. Um, you mentioned bus, Luke, and we just want to, you know, let people know if you aren't aware. Today, there's a vote in the DC Council uh, about Councilmember Charles Allen and Chair Phil Mendelson's idea to make buses in DC free to ride. At a breakfast meeting today, before the vote, a few reporters have said that Councilmember Kenyon McDuffie raised questions about the feasibility of this plan, like including whether Maryland and Virginia are going to have to fund this as well. Um, apparently, Charles Allen and Mendelssohn said most buses 
operate within the city. So it's not something where they're going into other, you know, the other states Mm. and that lowering fares have historically increased ridership. So possibly more people would be using the bus system, especially since they're now proposing maybe making Metro a little more expensive on the rail. Um, So today is the first vote on that legislation that would then go to a final vote later this month. But if it passes, D.C. would join cities like Boston and Kansas City and a lot of European cities where public buses are free to ride. Right. And it comes on the heels of a proposal we heard about a few months ago where Charles Allen said, oh, $100 to every resident. They then found that that was actually more expensive than this free bus riding uh, proposal because 100 bucks to every single resident, well, every single resident doesn't really ride that much. Right. So um, it's interesting to see how they're going to try to figure out how to make ridership more accessible to more people. When, uh, Luke, are they thinking about, You said I think you said July, they're thinking about doing um, hiking the fares or changing the fare system? Yeah, so this is under the uh, new fiscal year, budget fiscal year 2024, which would start July 1st. So it's not guaranteed that it would be that day, you know, July 1st, but that's the kind of understanding that it will start in the next fiscal year. And then what happens? Where does it go from here? Is there a vote on it or, or is this sort of just, this is what it's going to be? Yeah, this is this is very preliminary. Of course, the uh, board, the Metro board still has to approve it, all that kind of stuff. And then, as, as you said, feasibility still has to be there if you don't have enough 7000 series trains to right. to make that frequency happen you know, you're going to have to push it back. But there's definitely some approval. This is the very first budget. And as we all know, over the next three or four months, we're probably going to see a lot of changes to that before it's approved in, you know, March, April. We don't know much about the future of Metro, but what we do know is changes are afoot. <laughs> That's for sure. Yes. And Luke yes. will be on top of them. Luke Luker, thanks for joining us and giving us a breakdown here. Thanks, guys, for having me. And coming up after the break, we talked to Luke Luker about his hidden talent. Hint. It's a piece of cake. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602, changing lives. Explain your DNA on, on 10 cases, man. You're inside the police interrogation room with the alleged Potomac River rapist. I'm not guilty on any of this stuff. So calm, so reasonable. Could this be the man who terrorized women for nine years before murdering a brilliant scientist two decades ago? Experience one of the most fascinating true crime podcasts available. Join crime reporter Paul Wagner for Unknown Subject, season three of WTOP's American Nightmare series. Search American Nightmare Podcast on all podcast platforms. And before we go, Luke, we know you make cakes. And it's dessert day here in the WTOP newsroom. It's holiday week, and one of the one of the days is dessert day. But this year, we're changing it up and having people bring in their desserts. And then... We're missing you, Luke. Yeah, Luke Garrett tells me that Luke Lookert actually is like a basically amazing cake designer. And I'm like, wait, where's your where's your cake? Yeah, you know, he told... Uh, it seems like everybody in the newsroom. I actually got a comment from one of our producers, uh, Jake. <laughs> Oh, no. Just, you can hire about him to do five your PR. Ago, Sorry, Luke. Like, hey. Maybe that was a Luke make to Luke secret. Cakes. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's on my Instagram, so it's not secret. But um, I, you know, I used to make cakes uh, quite a bit. It is uh, kind of a a fun hobby yeah. that I, I picked up and really kind of stemmed from kind of like a, uh, mm, I wouldn't say it's a wager, but a drunken offer to one of my best buddies <laughs> saying like, oh hey, God. I started baking about a month ago. I'm sure I could make a wedding cake. And <laughs> a year later, I made his wedding cake. And over that course of that year, I got really into baking and learning how to make cakes. And I have ended up making five wedding cakes now. You're kidding. For, uh, buddies. Wow. Yeah. Wait, I, I wish so I would have known five... that. I could have saved a lot of money or I would have paid you the money <laughs> as opposed to some random baker. That's awesome. Well, it, and then that's kind of where it stemmed up. Uh, my buddy was like, you know, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to uh, afford a band. These cakes are so expensive. I was like, I'll make it. And uh, yeah, it I'll was, get a little uh, box cake for you. He's like, no, dude, you got to make it nice. It was uh, a stressful. The first one was very stressful. Uh, after that, though, it's all easy. Piece Wait, of cake. You did you did it. you make them like did you just do like <laughs> yellow cake or did you have to do the flavors and everything? Yeah, I did it all from scratch. Uh, so usually a vanilla cake, 
I, I would this. do a lemon curd filling oh my God. or a strawberry jam with a Cool Whip filling for some of them. Wow. Uh, the first one actually had a, a really unique flavor where I did an edible cookie dough filling for Whoa, one of Whoa, that sounds so that good. That was kind of cool. Wow. Yeah. Well, well, now you know. Um, Wait, we're going to have to share some of these photos because people are going to want to see your what, what these cakes look like. They're pretty They're pretty <laughs> badass. I don't know if I can say that. I think I can. But they're pretty good. The, the beer one, the one where like the, the pitcher of beer, oh, was yeah, that like a bachelor yeah, the, cake uh, or something? That was, I uh, saw a recipe and I saw that cake design and it was my buddy's birthday. And so I just made it for him That's for so his cool. birthday. That's and so we cool. actually took it to a uh, brewery and shared it with everybody at the brewery and ate there. We're, we might have know. like a second business opening for you if, if, if I mean, <laughs> our listeners are interested. Luke man, Luker, a renaissance too man. A too renaissance much work. Too I much mean, work. What, he does everything. Um, you know, you think that you get up early as a reporter, but then you uh, see the lives of bakers and man. Not even close. They have a, <laughs> They just have a rough life. <laughs> An early life for sure. Yeah. All right, Luke. Something well, we didn't know. Now we know. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Luke. <laughs> And that'll do it for us today for the DMV Download. We are brought to you by Steamfitters Local 602, and our music is by Real World. Rate our show and give us a review if you get the chance, good or bad. We'd love to hear from you. You can also find us on social media and dmvdownload.com. We have to also share some of those photos from Luke's case. Oh, for sure. We're going to put those on social for you guys today. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in the D.C. area, 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, Maryland. Online at WTOP.com and on the WTOP News app. Have a great night. 